So thank you again for inviting me to speak to you this evening about the role that vegan sanctuaries play in the animal rights movement. The animal rights movement is made up of humans and it's about changing human behavior. And while intersectional aspects are very relevant, above all, our movement is about other animals. So where better to focus our attention than the sanctuaries where those who are fortunate enough to be rescued live out their lives and show us who they are. If you follow a lot of sanctuaries, especially if you follow them on social media, you might notice that there's a tendency to either focus on the more dramatic rescues or on the lighthearted fun side of this work. This is because these are the themes that fund sanctuaries, but I believe that they fail to capture their essence. This focus on the more titillating aspects of sanctuaries stems from our species' notion that other animals are here to amuse or entertain us. I hope that at the end of this talk, you'll gain a new perspective on sanctuaries as places of safety, of respect and dignified care, places that foster the animal's independence and autonomy as much as they can, places that recognize animal personhood, places that offer a second chance to other animals, not because they suffer per se, but because they have futures and lives that are as meaningful to them as our lives are to us. I'd like to give you an appreciation for the invaluable role that sanctuaries and the animals who live on them play in providing education on sentience and cognition, on the effects of human use on their bodies, lives and personalities on how we can eradicate speciesism in very simple ways, such as the language we use to speak about them and the ways in which we regard them as our equals. You can see by our interactions with the sanctuary animals that this isn't just our work. They are friends and our family. When they're ill, we worry about them. And when we lose them, our hearts are broken. And we grieve just as we would for any friend or family member. Some of the animals who first joined us in 2008 have only died in the last year or two. So when we speak or write about this, we're not just showing you how we feel, we're showing you their personhood and how much they matter. When we go outside, they call us, even from a distance. And anybody who ever comes to our sanctuary delivering goods or doing a bit of work for, for us, uh, they notice this and they're very surprised by it. They've never seen it before. We recognize their individual voices because we recognize them as individuals. And we talk back to them. Our work is very difficult physically and emotionally, but it's immensely rewarding. But most of all, as animal rights activists, we know rescued animals very well. Sanctuaries witness at first hand the effects of selective breeding, oppression, confinement and harm on our victims. Amma arrived at our sanctuary over a year ago with a prolapse. She had left her field in desperation and gone into the local motor factors using distress calls to get help. The fact that she did this shows her agency and it shows how much her life meant to her. By the time we found her, she was close to death. Many of these consequences of human use are only ever documented by sanctuaries because we care about how they feel, because we use veterinary care and because the animals live with us until, until the end of their lives. Farmed animals don't grow old anywhere else. But we don't only witness the problems they experience. We see who they are and what they are capable of despite what we have done to them. The word sanctuary means refuge or place of safety. A vegan animal sanctuary is a place of refuge from a world where animals are treated as commodities, where they have no rights where they are slaughtered. Sanctuaries have existed for thousands of years, offering refuge and protection to victims of oppression, war and persecution. 
In fact, in the Middle Ages, ages, sanctuary was often provided from the law. In a sense, this is what vegan sanctuaries offer. They protect other animals to the best of their ability from their legal status as human property and from the standard legal practices that harm them and result in their deaths. Eden is a vegan farmed animal sanctuary, so a lot of my talk and slides will show farmed animals. I believe this is important. The vast majority of animal refuges cater for cats and dogs, horses and ponies and wildlife, and they're doing fantastic work. And a lot of animal advocates devote their effort to helping these species. But farmed animals make up the greatest numbers of animals exploited by us. They are used primarily as food, but also for clothing and footwear in agricultural, pharmaceutical and military research and for cleaning products and cosmetics. Blackie's family were used for hunting as a tourist attraction. They were all killed in front of him when he was still a very young goat. While our advocacy at Eden is anti-speciesist in general and our campaigning includes all forms of animal use, we believe that by focusing on the animals who are used most, we increase the chances of people going vegan. Our logo encapsulates the essence of our work. Far from being an act of charity, the existence of a vegan sanctuary that accords other animals their rights is a political act. We regard it as the right of every individual to be free from ownership by another. We believe the life of every sentient individual matters equally, regardless of species. In our view, when humans live as vegans, they don't just love animals and they don't just eat a plant-based diet. They respect the right of everyone not to be owned, used, exploited, harmed or killed regardless of their species membership. In recognition of the intersectional nature of veganism, we also regard these as human rights and we recognize the interconnectedness of human and animal exploitation. Our, our logo, liberty, equality, veganism, represents this philosophy of animal rights. Eden exists because in our view, animal use and killing is unjust. Our objective is to give a home to victims of animal use so that their rights are no longer violated by being bred, used and killed by humans. Eden provides them with a home, not because they are suffering or because of how they are treated, but because they are enduring the injustice of being used to serve humans as though they were objects instead of feeling beings. Many of the animals who live with us, like Merlin in this photo, are victims of appalling treatment, even torture. Merlin was found with the rope that confined him embedded in his neck. But that's not why we rescued them. Our purpose is not the prevention or relief of suffering. Our purpose is to respect their rights and help others to stop using them. We rescued them because they are being used and face slaughter, because they are victims of the legal standard practice that constitutes animal agriculture and is demanded by a non-vegan world. At all times, our aim is to create a world where sanctuaries are no longer needed. Sanctuaries are a temporary solution. They're not the answer to the problem of animal use. Only veganism, along with the complete abolition of human use of other animals and a radical revision of how we think and feel about them as our sentient equals can ever be a solution to the problem they face at our human hands. Eden has grown enormously over the last few years, expanding to more than 40 acres and home now to 240 animals. But it began as a very small sanctuary and it opened quite accidentally over 14 years ago when we were given two orphaned lambs. Not long afterwards, we rescued a group of chickens and some ducks and geese. That small group quickly became our teachers because we weren't vegan when we opened the sanctuary. They taught us primarily that their lives have meaning and purpose for them, independent of the fact that they've been bred for human use. 
they showed their individual personalities and preferences. We realized that like us, they have physical and emotional feelings. I remember one day one of the lambs hurt his foot and he trembled with pain. These, this was in the very early stages of opening the sanctuary. And that was when it struck me that they experienced the same feelings as us. When I used to watch them jumping or the chickens running for their favorite food or spreading out their wings to sunbathe, it began to dawn on me that not only can they suffer, but they experience pleasure. They value their lives and they want to continue living. And they share a vast array of our mental characteristics, such as motivation, frustration, memory, preferences, anticipation, hope, dread, loneliness and fun. They have rich social and emotional lives and complex cognitive abilities. They are very much our equals. We went vegan because of what we learned from the animals in our care and in my own case in particular after visiting a dairy which I subsequently described in our ads. We formed an extraordinary bond with one of the hens we first rescued called Matilda and through her and the other hens we learned about the exploitation of the reproductive system in the egg industry. On the night she died I promised her that Eden would dedicate itself not only to providing a sanctuary for animals rescued from human use, but that it would become a place of advocacy dedicated to informing people about the individual animals we harm and our moral obligation to be vegan. That promise has been the bedrock of Eden's advocacy. Sanctuaries exist primarily to be a home to those who are fortunate enough to be rescued and live with us. But by their very existence and through their communication with both the animal rights movement and the non-vegan world, sanctuaries play a very important role in educating people about other animals. Eden has engaged in vegan education from the time of its inception. Our methods, ideas and language have changed somewhat over the years, but what has not changed at all is how we center the animals of Eden in their own animal rights movement, using what we learn about them at our sanctuary in our advocacy and featuring them in our educational materials. I used to give a weekly course introducing people to veganism in our local town, and I used to put a huge amount of effort into it, so I'd give a talk about the sanctuary, about animal rights, veganism, or maybe I'd focus on a single aspect of animal use, like the dairy or the egg industry. And then we'd take a break um, and have some food that I would have cooked and brought in with us. And people would gather around and have a chat and gather up the literature and the books that I have brought in with me. And then in the second half, we'd look at, at a film. So it was a well-constructed course and it was very interesting and it helped people to go vegan. But I was frustrated because I knew the power of Eden's residents to enrich vegan education. And yet I was only reaching a minuscule number of people for, for an awful lot of work. In 2015, we began an advertising campaign with the aim of bringing to public attention the same information that led us to going vegan. The plan was to demonstrate animal sentience by letting the animals speak for themselves in a way that challenges public species' perception of them. And to shine a light on the injustice of animal use so that people would be prompted to research the issues for themselves. In a sense, we brought the sanctuary to the streets. There was enormous media interest and we did several <coughs> radio interviews every week. And the topic was discussed on some prime time TV shows. So this gave us a wonderful opportunity to showcase how vegans use a different language and have a different understanding of other animals. When people hear this view, they recognize its rationality. It encourages them to see other animals for who they are and to recognize that they have as much right to live free from oppression as we have. In an era where veganism has become reduced to a diet or a form of consumerism, it gives us the chance to explain its true meaning. <laughs> um, 
it's a Surprising actually the number of people who contacted me to say that a, a television show in particular prompted them to go vegan. The campaign was such a success that in 2016 it moved to the UK throughout England and Northern Ireland and it has since appeared in Scotland, the Isle of Man, Jersey and in Canada and it's had a consistent presence in Ireland. At the outset, I had faith in the public I was addressing through Go Vegan World. I believe that people are receptive when the message is given honestly, clearly, consistently and powerfully. And I'll, at a later stage in the talk, show you how some of the theories behind our campaign support what we learned anecdotally from the animals in our sanctuary. The power of Go Vegan World is that it is in effect, run by the residents of Eden. They inspire and inform my campaign decisions. And the campaign creativity, the ads, are based on my many years of working with them. They feature in the ads, not as anonymous members of the species we use, but as unique beings with personalities, histories, and a home at Eden. That is why Go Vegan World has expanded to be one of the most effective campaigns of its kind. Our sanctuary work ensures that our claims are grounded in reality. And I think this makes a big difference to the people that we speak to. For example, I was doing a radio interview recently about a claim um, that had been made that veganism is less healthy and less environmentally friendly than animal agriculture. And during that interview, I was able to read the ingredients from the bag of grain that we use to feed the animals. The same grain that every farmer in Ireland uses. So number one, this showed that imported grain that causes deforestation is used to feed Irish animals. And number two, that it's fortified with much the same nutrients that vegans get from fortified foods such as calcium and B12. By reading this label, I was able to explain very clearly to listeners that anyone casting aspersions on a vegan diet because it requires supplements or fortified foods needs to research the animal agricultural industry, which does exactly the same thing. Another example of the effectiveness of Go Vegan World is our successful challenge to the failure of schools in Scotland to provide vegan options on school menus. This made front page news on several Scottish newspapers, and it was also followed up by other media outlets, again, giving us a great chance to discuss uh, veganism from the perspective of animal rights. Because the campaign tells the truth about the injustice of animal use, in such an effective manner, it has unsurprisingly faced many challenges from those with the vested interest in animal exploitation. But it has persevered nonetheless, and attempts to shut us down have backfired on the industry. When the Ulster Farmers Union persuaded the body responsible for bus transport in Northern Ireland to remove our ads, we successfully challenged that refusal as an unlawful interference with our legal right to freedom of expression. They were forced to reverse the decision and they have since run our ads on buses um, across Northern Ireland. Go Vegan World's most significant successes to date have been the findings by the Advertising Standards Authority in favour of Go Vegan World and against the vivisection and dairy industries. These findings allowed us to continue referring to animal research as torture and to label dairy as unjust and inhumane. And the challenges themselves drew a lot of unwanted attention to the industry, so it very much backfired on them. For those of you who are not aware of the cases, I'm just going to very briefly go through the finding on the dairy ad to give you some background. Although the finding um, on, the, on animal research as torture was equally important and it hasn't received an awful lot of attention. We ran this ad in the Telegraph newspaper in February 2017. It shows this cow behind a barbed wire fence and it describes my visit to a dairy in early 2009, which was what prompted me to go vegan. It reads, I went vegan the day I visited a dairy. The mothers, still bloody from birth, searched and called frantically for their babies. 
They are daughters, fresh from their mother's wombs, but separated from them, trembled and cried piteously, drinking milk from rubber teats on the wall instead of their mother's nurturing breasts. All because humans take their milk. Their sons are slaughtered for their flesh, and they themselves are slaughtered at six years. Their natural lifespan is 25 years. I could no longer participate in that. Can you? Complaints were made to the Advertising Standards Authority by the National Farmers <coughs> Union, alleging that the claims in the ad could not be substantiated and that they would mislead readers. Their argument was that the welfare regulations are adhered to, so our claim that dairy is inhumane was untrue. We substantiated all the claims made in the ad by providing evidence from the dairy industry itself and from peer-reviewed scientific journals. Our response demonstrated that far from suggesting that the issue is a failure to comply with welfare regulations, dairy production is inherently unjust and inhumane, even on the, under the best standards of welfare. Based on the evidence provided in our submission, the ASA ruled in our favour, rejecting the notion that our claim was misleading and permitting us to continue using the ad. This was highly significant and unprecedented in animal rights campaigning. So how did our small sanctuary win this right for other animals that is so significant that it made front page news on the time, on the Times, coverage in all prominent Irish and UK media outlets, as well as media coverage in many countries worldwide? I believe it did so because it's indebted to the animals who live at Eden. It's a very simple campaign that tells the truth. One that lets the animals speak for themselves. One that carefully considers what other animals need from us and endeavors to educate the public so they can meet those needs. At Go Vegan World, we believe that challenging speciesism is probably the most important thing we can do for other animals. Our ads are simple enough for children to understand. They illustrate to us the hypocrisy of imagining that we, in inverted commas, love other animals while paying to have them killed for us. In the same way that our sanctuary is not only for victims of cruelty, it is for victims of human use, exploitation and oppression. The focus of our ads is not on welfare, but on rights and the confrontation of speciesism. What you are looking at is not a breach of animal welfare. This is standard legal practice on pig farms. Remember that animal welfare legislation does nothing to protect the interests of animals. It's a set of guidelines on how to breed, exploit and kill them. Of course, what you are looking at is, cru is cruel. Of course, it's appalling, but it's not actually a breach of the legislation. Breaches are what we refer to as acts of animal cruelty that deviate from the norm. What we need to object to is that norm, the standard legal practice that happens on farms, in laboratories and slaughterhouses everywhere. So I appeal to those of you who are advocates to refrain from referring to animal cruelty and instead highlight the in simple injustice of animal use. Almost everyone is already opposed to animal cruelty, but almost everyone accepts the legal standard practice of animal agriculture and animal use, even though those practices are the stuff of nightmares. I'll return to this conflict between our values and our behaviour shortly. My point here is that what we need people to understand is that this is not simply isolated incidents of animal cruelty, and this is not what we need to object to. All animal use violates their rights. All of it is inhumane. When they are rescued from these appalling conditions and we begin to see them not as a mass of species who are being exploited, but that as unique individuals on sanctuaries like Emily in this photo, it quickly becomes obvious that there's no just way to use another animal as food or any other resource. Nothing would justify taking Emily's life from her when it has meaning for her and when she hasn't yet reached the end of her natural lifespan. 
So rather than focus on animal cruelty and other breaches of animal welfare legislation, Go Vegan World helps to educate people on the standard legal practices, including slaughter, that take place in the life of the animals we use when we make non-vegan choices. By doing so, we make sure that people understand that it's not how animals are treated that's wrong. What's wrong is that we use them at all. This is the greatest lesson that the animals at Eden have taught us, and we believe it's the most important aspect of our work. Piecemeal campaigning and highlighting animal cruelty merely target the symptoms of a much deeper problem. The methods we have developed at Go Vegan World from what we have learned from the animals at Eden are also supported by the scientific literature on the psychology of animal use. Most of us believe that we're pretty decent people. We believe that it's wrong to hurt other animals unnecessarily. Yet most of us are not vegan. Non-vegans harm other animals and every time they take out their wallets and pay for an animal product, they are responsible for someone being slaughtered and for another animal being bred into a life of misery to replace the one who has just been killed. And as we've seen from the previous slides, absolutely nothing condones what we do to them. There may be many aspects of animal use that are hidden from public view, such as the horrors of killing day-old chicks, prolapses and cancer rates among hens in the egg industry, separating calves from their mothers in the dairy industry, artificial insemination of cows, pigs and turkeys, mutilations, the violence of slaughter and the torturous practices of animal research. Many of these practices are most usefully highlighted by people who work with the victims on sanctuaries. But while most people are unaware of them, for the most part, they are all aware that animals are killed for us when we're not vegan. We know that the products on our shop shelves couldn't be there if the animals were not exploited and killed. Yet we continue to buy them, even though we claim that other animals are worthy of our care. So our behavior conflicts with our morals. These conflicting views cause psychological discomfort in something that we refer to as cognitive dissonance. That's the mental conflict that occurs when a person's behaviors and beliefs are not aligned or when they hold two contradictory beliefs, such as on the one hand, the belief that animals matter, but on the other hand, the belief that farmed animals don't matter. Cognitive dissonance causes feelings of unease and tension, and people attempt to relieve the discomfort of this in several ways. Uh, so, for example, you'll, you'll know this from your own advocacy. They explain things away, or they attempt to rationalize, or they reject new information that conflicts with their existing beliefs. A very common strategy to deal with cognitive dissonance among non-vegans is denying that other animals feel and have minds. Studies show that the perception of other animals as being different to us and as lacking mental attributes, such as the capacity for pain and denial of their ability to perceive and process information are some of the most significant psychological mechanisms that support non-veganism. Animals are considered uh, animals considered appropriate for human consumption are considered to have diminished mental capacities and people are motivated to deny minds to the animals they use, especially when they are reminded of the link between animal products and the fact that animals are killed for those products. Expecting to consume animal flesh in the near future increases the denial that animals have minds. And in turn, the negative, feelings, the negative feelings associated with holding values that conflict with our behavior are reduced by these forms of denial. Therefore, denying that other animals have minds and can feel facilitates animal use and it protects the culture of speciesism and non-veganism. So these are the aspects that we try to counter in our ads. The most frequently used strategy of Go Vegan World is to illustrate animal sentience and to remind people of the connection between the products they use and the animals they used to be. 
A case in point is Cormac, who lives at Eden and was rescued from the dairy industry seven years ago. He was unwanted because he was born male on a dairy farm. Cormac would have been uh, killed if he hadn't found a home with us. And as you can see, he's very much someone and not something. He's a curious, intelligent, gentle giant who's very special to us. And he was the first cow to come to Eden. So we had the privilege of acting as his surrogate mother. He has appeared in several Go Vegan World ads, such as this one that dispels the notion that dairy is the only source of uh, dietary source of calcium. And this one about personal choice. I mentioned one of our first hens, Matilda, in an earlier slide. Her influence can be seen in our campaign, particularly in the ads that show the sentience of all the animals and of chickens and those that address the egg industry. So if we have enough time, I'm just going to spend a few minutes on the egg industry because it tends to be overshadowed by the focus on other species and egg production in, in, is generally not very well understood, even in our own animal rights movement. There aren't a lot of organizations that provide useful and accurate information on the topic. And discussion of the egg industry is also a very useful way to show the difference between animal welfare and animal rights. Two million hens are bred into the egg industry in Ireland every year. This figure does not include other birds who are used for their eggs, such as ducks and quails. Equal numbers of male and female chicks hatch. Males don't lay eggs, so the industry can't profit from them. As a result, they are killed shortly after birth by gassing or live maceration. If there are 2 million females in the egg industry, it's probable that another 2 million males were killed. This is what animal welfare means. It's a set of guidelines on how to exploit and kill innocent animals, including those who have just been born. And in case anyone is in any doubt, the reference for this directive can be, find, can be found in the Irish statute book. This is what we ask for when we advocate animal welfare instead of animal rights. In 2013, we were asked to write a report on the egg industry for an exhibition on chickens. The report called Enriched Cages, Embodied Prisons is a detailed examination of the history of egg production. And it demonstrates very clearly that the treatment of chickens in the egg industry is of secondary consideration to the fact that we use them in the first place. Hens evolved from free living birds in Southeast Asia like any free living bird, whether they are a pheasant or a blackbird or a robin, hens in their natural state only lay eggs in the spring and summer for the purpose of hatching their young. The science of selective breeding has resulted in hens ovulating on an almost daily basis to meet the human demand for their eggs. At Eden, we have rescued hens from a variety of backgrounds. And they are all harmed by the fact that they are selectively bred to, to lay eggs, irrespective of the conditions in which they are farmed before they came to us or the labels that were used on their eggs. Because we gave good veterinary care from the outset, even when we were a very small, underfunded sanctuary, we quickly gained an understanding of the effects that selective breeding has on their bodies, such as egg impaction and infection, very high risk of fracture prolapsed reproductive organs, which is fatal if not treated, and rates of reproductive cancer that are so high that egg-laying hens are used in medical research to better understand human reproductive cancer. For the last few years, we have routinely used implants in our rescued hens, which has very significantly reduced the incidence of the health issues and that subsequently prolonged their lifespans and greatly improved their quality of life. Missy was rescued from a free range egg farm in 2016. You can see the difference that receiving regular implants has made to her health, her lifespan and her quality of life. She's still with us six years later because the implant stopped her laying eggs. 
Lottery cages were banned in Ireland in, in 2012, in Europe actually, and replaced within rich cages. Unfortunately, the ban has led to the impression that there are no caged hens in, in Ireland, but the vast majority of eggs produced in this country come from farms like this one. However, free range farms are not much better. And organic farms also seem to be the same. In all the ways that matter to hens, conditions of exploitation are appalling, regardless of labels. The secondary effects of exploitation are experienced regardless of where they are exploited, making labels such as free range or organic nothing more than a sham design, designed to portray animal rights violations as acceptable, normal, natural, necessary and nice. The hens at Eden come from a variety of these backgrounds, but many of them come from apparently benign backyard situations where they are being kept as pets who lay eggs. Some of them actually so-called rescued hens, even though they don't live on the appalling farms that you've seen in the previous photos, they also have been selectively bred to overovulate and lay eggs, if not on a daily basis, too frequently. So they suffer the same imprisonment in exhausted, sick bodies that hens in cages experience. In addition to the annual deaths of millions of male chicks, every bird bred into the egg industry is slaughtered, regardless of the farm they were exploited on. Eggs are not an essential component of the human diet. It's possible to get all the nutrients we need on a 100% plant diet. Therefore, their short, miserable lives and premature deaths occur because of our demand for taste, convenience and habit. These are the basic tenets of the style of advocacy that we engage in, which has only been possible for us because of what we've learned from the chickens we've rescued at Eden. I'm a psychologist and I still run a clinical practice alongside my sanctuary work, where I've been specialising in human trauma for over 20 years. I know how much courage it takes for someone to recover from a traumatic life experience. So I have enormous respect for the animals at Eden who thrive despite what the non-vegan world has done to them. This group of sheep were rescued from a slaughterhouse three years ago. They were left waiting in a field beside a river during a beef protest when slaughter was temporarily stopped. As the river rose, they began to drown something that apparently frequently happens at this particular slaughterhouse. Someone took them to safety, and after a lot of wrangling with the slaughterhouse, we were able to bring all of them to Eden except one who drowned. They were in very poor health when they arrived, but they've made a fantastic recovery. One of them, Mamu, was pregnant when we rescued her, and she gave birth to twins, Ruth and Sarah. And one of them, Angel, has appeared in several of our ads. If you follow our social media pages, you'll see countless stories of the courageous individuals who live at Eden and who, who have survived against the odds and who continue to inspire and inform our advocacy. I'm grateful to each and every individual one of them for what they have contributed to Go Vegan World. And I encourage you to look to individuals like them in sanctuaries everywhere. It is their animal rights movement. It is to them we must look when we ask ourselves about the best ways to advocate. I'm going to end by giving you a flavor of the campaign and then I'll take questions if anyone has any. I wanna see the world united and learn to live as one. I wanna see the world united and learn to live as one. I wanna see the world united, learn to live as one. I wanna see the world united, learn to as one, the lock 
Just one lucky, and I. 